I have a good business. It's a growing business. Mm -hmm. And I can still do these other things. And it's a great life. Like you don't have to be a prisoner to Facebook and Instagram. You don't have to be a slave to your email box. You can have space. You don't have to look busy. You, you can get what you need, to, most of what you need to be, be done in three or four hours, not eight or 10. Yep. Next up, representing Primal Life Organics, Josh Making Bank Felber. Welcome to Making Bank. I am Josh Felber, where we uncover the mindset and the success strategies of the top 1% so you can amplify your life and your business today. Uh, super excited and honored for today's guest. He's back for a third time. We're turning everybody into ninjas at solving business problems. Marshall is one of the most expensive business strategists in the world. He's endorsed in Forbes and Inc. magazine. He's guided clients like FanDuel and Fusionsoft from startup to over hundreds of millions of dollars. Perry also founded the 10 Million Evolution 2.0 Prize with judges from Harvard, Oxford, MIT. Launched it at the Royal Society in London. It's the world's largest science research center. NASA's Jet Propulsion Labs uses his 80-20 curve as a productivity tool. His reinvention of Pareto's principles is published in Harvard Business Review. His uh, Google book laid the foundations for the 100 billion pay-per-click industry and the ultimate guide to Google ads is the world's best-selling book on internet advertising. Marketing maverick Dan Kennedy says, if you don't know who Perry Marshall is, it's unforgivable. Perry's an honest man in the field, rife with charlatans. Perry Marshall's work is referenced in dozens of influential marketing books, as well as he's consulted in over 300 industries. He has a degree in electrical engineering and lives in Chicago. Excited to welcome Perry Marshall back to Making Bank. Thank you, Josh. Great to be here. And lots we're going to talk about today. So for sure, step in. All right. Uh, yeah. So I, I this landed on my desk. <laughs> Let me see. Make sure yeah. it's a detox, declutter and dominate. I think I added for 2021 <laughs> after all the craziness of 2020. And I know we were talking a little bit, bit off air for a few minutes. And you said this was originally going to be a 150 page book. And I think now it's 36 pages. So, <laughs> so tell us a little bit about what happened there. And then we'll dive into all all this amazing content that it got dialed into. So my co-author, Robert Strobe, um, at the time he wasn't a co-author, he was just a friend who was helping me make my book better. And I sent him a 150 page manuscript and he sends it back and he goes, Perry, I 80-20 your book. 
which in, in, in my world, 80, 20 is a verb and the verb means you <laughs> chop out the 80% that doesn't matter. Um, and he goes, here you go. It's, I got it. I get this down to 8,000 words, Perry and hold on. Cause if we add some graphics to this, this thing's really going to sizzle. And I'm like, you got rid of 80% of my book, <laughs> but see being the 80, 20 guy, what? He, he knows he can do that because if he cut out the right 80%, it's still 80% is good. Right. It's just 80% is long. And so I'm actually was so impressed with, especially when he added in the graphics, because there's a bunch of in, infographics to illustrate the concepts and, and convey the ideas. I said, Rob, I'm making you a co-author of this book because that was a brilliant move. In fact, that is one of Rob's gifts. His name is Robert Scrobe. Mm -hmm. uh, is distilling things down to their simplest essence. And I can't think of a better book to do that with than a book that is. So here's the purpose of this book is first of all, the concept is multiply by subtracting, mm -hmm. excel by eliminating that the, the biggest obstacle to you being successful is the extra baggage that you're carrying around. Okay. And secondly, is to replace whatever you've been operating on before, like the, the operating system of your business mind to replace it with something that is just as valid for a $10,000 business as a $10 million business or vice versa. There are a lot of business philosophies that work great at 500,000 sure and they don't work at all at 50 million right and 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 most people would never like if you're starting if you're like a freelancer and you're hustling some gigs it would never occur to you that you might be operating on a set of assumptions that will totally stop working once your business gets to a certain size cuz you know, people are just in survival mode. So I, I can genuinely say this is probably the only book you could read that's just as valid from one end of the spectrum to the other. And that's interesting you say, I mean, I have owned multiple businesses over the years and everything, and even our current one uh, with Primal Life Organics and seeing the different stages, you know, as we hit a million, as you hit two, five, you know, and that kind of thing, is you have to kind of start to change how you look and do and act things because there was one year where we kind of like stagnated and it was like, well, what's going on? Why didn't we grow? Why didn't, you know, we, we hit, you know, three, but then why did we go back to two? And, you know, and we had to really take a look at how we were looking at, like as you said, the operating system or your thought process. And since you kind of brought it up, I kind of like to dive into that a little bit because I think it's super intriguing and just kind of a few years ago going through all of that and really trying to understand it. So I'll kind of open it back up to you and kind of let's, t let's start to break that down. Yeah, so the, at the beginning of the, the, the book is a story of how this actually got started. Sure. And it was, it was about five years ago. <clears throat> it was a, it was in February. It was kind of like today, except it was cloudy instead of sunny. And I was talking on the phone and I looked through the French doors of my office and the president of my company had suddenly appeared in the next room. And I'm like, I'm in Chicago, he's in Nebraska, what's he doing? <laughs> so the president, so I'm the CEO, president of my company shows up unannounced. Right. And I'm like, is this good? I don't think this is good. <laughs> so I, I get off the phone, I'm like, Brian, Harry, what are you doing here? We need to talk, Harry. And he gets this undertakerish tone mm. in his voice. He says, we have too many projects. We have too many expenses, too many vendors, too many employees, and not enough cash. And uh, we're going to go splat if we don't make some changes. That was probably 2.30 on a Friday afternoon. Mm. It's always on a Friday afternoon. <laughs> 
(laughs) (laughs) That's when it always comes up. Yes, you've had these conversations. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but go ahead. 2.30 on a Friday we argued afternoon. Until 11 o'clock at night. In fact, I remember it's like, well, you know, we got done. Uh, after we'd spent so much time at one coffee shop, then we go to the, like a Thai restaurant. And then like, we're, and we're like, we're having this basically argument. And so after arguing with, about this for eight hours, I'm like, Brian, Brian, you, you you don't realize how brilliant, you know, maybe you just can't, maybe you're blinded, you know, by the extraordinary brilliance of, of you know, you realize what's going to happen when this one pops and what's, you know, we got this project in the oven. It's just about ready to go. And like, I know you've never heard any other entrepreneur say, right. <laughs> <laughs> no, we don't do all that. <laughs> And, and so, um, now he, I made a couple of concessions, but basically I just completely pushed back on him and kicked the can down the road another three months. And three months later, we now had a real serious problem. Mm. Um, because he was actually right. And finally it kind of dawned on me. He's actually right. <clears throat> we're going to have to 80, 20, the business, the way Rob sort of 80, 20, the book. And we're going to have to cut as much fat as we can without cutting muscle, which is not easy. No. And we're going to be spending months doing this and you waited too long to do it. So it's also going to be really painful. And I spent the whole summer just, Every three days, we were having another trim, cut, reduce. We probably laid off a third of my staff and just cut a bunch of stuff. And But here's here's the thing. First of all, it was the first time I had ever completely switched to a subtraction mindset Mm. and really done, see, 80-20 80-20 is not just about identifying the top 1% or the top 5% of what you ought to be doing. Okay, it is about that. But it's also about you have to cut out a whole bunch of trivial stuff before you have the resources to focus on the 1%. Because otherwise, you're just thinking about the 1%. And you're not actually doing sure. it. Okay, and... When we finally got that ship righted, it was like, dang, this thing is a whole lot easier to run and easier to navigate and less stress and less pressure and fewer things that we have to jam through the machine to make this thing work. And it was a complete mindset shift for me. And that was the genesis of this book because eventually I needed to like get it out there. Yeah, no, that's, uh, you know, the, you know, I see, I mean, we've I've been through that exactly. And, you know, we've had to do that. It's like, oh, here's where we are. You know, it's like, we got to cut this and, you know, get, you know, our um, team, you know, tighten up the team, make them more efficient, reduce the number of people uh, and, you know, really, really cut stuff back. And when you do, it is, it is kind of like that. Oh man, okay, it is a relief. It allows you to now really, like you said, focus, uh, as well as put the money where it actually really needs to go, not just on all the useless stuff that just kind of floats around. So, and so yeah, so you said that kind of stemmed in the the direction of this book. One of the things when I was going through it, as you kind of talked about the seven steps of finding the gleaming sword at the bottom of the swamp, which I thought was kind of funny because yeah. I just watched a movie with my kids a few weeks ago and uh, it was about the, uh, the sword and the stone and the, and the, uh, I can't remember mm-hmm. the name of that one movie, but, and I remember them throwing the sword into the, what's that? Could have been King Arthur. Arthur yeah, yeah, it was a King, uh, but it was uh, the newer version of it. Um, yeah, okay. but uh, so I remember they were throwing the sword into the swamp, and then it would then they would call for it, and it would come back when they needed it and stuff. So that's what I, I was like, oh, hey, it popped into my head. But kind of give us an idea of what that is and how we can apply that in our business. Well, so so 
the story comes from Beowulf, which some people read it in high school or yeah. college, and some people did. It's it's a brilliant story, but no, but most people don't know what it's about. It's thirteen hundred years old. It's the oldest story in anything resembling English. Um, and so, in the, in the story, um, there's a king named Hrothgar, and he's got a beer hall, and his men like to go there and drink beer and you know, talk about their exploits, except there's a problem. And the problem is every now and then a monster named Grendel likes to kick in the door and walk in there and like kill people and eat them. And then go like back to the swamp where he came from and he has magic and nobody can kill him. Well, Beowulf is a consultant. In case you ever wondered what who Beowulf Beowulf is a consultant, he's just like you and me, and he and and word gets to Beowulf that you know there's this company that's issuing RFQs like you know how much will you charge to come and kill the monster for us, and so he shows up and he tells his stories and he gives them his case studies and white papers and talks about swimming around in the ocean and killing. Uh, you know, killing monsters and everything. And, and, and it's like, okay, you got the job. And like, if you could do this, you get like my daughter's hand in marriage and I'll give you half the kingdom. And right. And so, and like, and Beowulf is like really a seriously badass guy. He's 30 times as strong as a regular man. And uh, so Grendel, sure enough, Grendel shows up and he rips Grendel's arm right out of his socket. And, Grendel goes stomping back into the swamp and bleeding, bleeding to death. And they hang the arm up in the beer hall and yeah. Yay, you did it. And everything is great until a couple days later, Grendel's mother shows up and she is mad. And then she kills a bunch more people. And then she goes back to the swamp. Okay, and this is, see, this is where it gets interesting, because this is all about real life. Like, all these stories about real life, like, if you think you're just reading fairy tales to your children, and they're just, no, no. Okay, if you kill a problem, but you don't kill the thing that gave birth to the problem, you didn't kill the problem. Yeah, (laughs) that's... This is how most problems are. And most people are killing problems. Whack, 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 whack. And they're, and they're, and they're not dealing with the, thing, the root of the problem. Well, so Grendel's mother lives in a swamp. And, and this is the most brilliant part, I think, of the whole story, is it says that this swamp was so evil and so bad that a deer being chased by wolves would rather get eaten by wolves than dive into the swamp. Okay. And nobody wants to go in the swamp and Grendel's like, well, the only way you're going to kill that mother is you're, I, I got to go down there. So he like gets all his stuff and he dives down, 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 gets to the bottom of the swamp. He, he finds her lair and then he starts wrestling with her and he finds out his magical sword does not work mm. there because there's magic down there. And so she almost kills him, but he, he sees this other sword that was forged by orcs or something. <laughs> and, 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 he, and he gets it and he kills Grendel's mother and now she's dead. And now the problem is actually solved. Okay. And, the takeaway from that is number one, the, the root of the problem is at the bottom of a swamp that nobody wants to go into. Mm. Every, in fact, everybody is trying to avoid even, they're, they're all pr- trying to pretend it's not there even is there. No swamp. <laughs> there right. is no swamp. What, what yeah. swamp? There's no swamp. This is a gated <laughs> community. There's the clubhouse. There's, what, what are you talking about, right? They try to make you think you're crazy. You're like, uh, I saw a monster come kick in the door of the beer hall and kill a bunch of people last night. Didn't you see that? No, we didn't see that. Yeah. Right. Okay. 
And the weapons that you have at the top of the swamp don't work at the bottom of the swamp. You only figure out the weapons you need when you're at the bottom of the swamp. Mm -hmm. what's, what's the bottom of the swamp? It's the root of the problem. And most problems have roots that are very deep. And now, now why, why this story in very brief form is in this book, why, you know, like if, if, if I am not wasting a single word in 36 pages and like, this is the master business strategy for your whole life, why would I put that story? It's because most people only deal with the surface level of problems and they never deal with the roots. I'm telling you, when you get to the roots of problems, not only do you solve the problem, you will find you have also usually have, usually that sword will work on a hundred other monsters too, or at least 10. <laughs> More than one. <laughs> okay, like, well, like when you, when you solve really deep problems, okay, so like, for example, Uber solved the taxi problem, at least in my opinion, like oh, I yeah. hated taxis. I, I think I sold my car three years ago and I mostly take Uber now, not bad, right? Well, Uber also has Uber Eats. Like, they're solving a generalized transportation and delivery problem, not just a taxi mm -hmm. problem, right? And it turns out Uber Eats has been very important in a pandemic. Sure. Right, right. And so so this is a whole mindset. And, man, if, if you have a bottom of the swamp mindset, um, you, like, you have a total lay down advantage compared to everybody else. Um, and you will go places that most other people will never go. And, and kings will invite you into their kingdoms that would never invite anybody else. And, and you can take that to the bank. And so I guess, how do we get a bottom of the swamp mindset? <laughs> that just sounds well, kind of bad, but it's actually really good. <laughs> Oh, it's, well, look, look, it's, it, it's what makes you right. a hero. And if you read the whole Beowulf story, I mean, there's like audible versions of Beowulf that are great. I mean, it's you listen to this and it's like, this is where Lord of the Rings came from. <laughs> oh, OK. Like, yeah. All right. So, I mean, it's really like Beowulf is like the hero. He's like he's like he's like the the best guy in the whole land after he kills Grendel's yep. mother. OK, he, he, you get everything when you kill the, the monster in the bottom of the swamp. OK, so how do you get to the bottom of the swamp? Usually you have to ask why five mm -hmm. times. It's like, well, OK, so why aren't the checks getting deposited when the guy takes them to the bank? You know, and, 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 and then you get sort of an answer and you go, OK, and why? Right. And by the time you get to the fifth why, everybody's irritated. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but but usually usually it's about the fourth or fifth why 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 and like well then you fix that problem like all of these other things are better makes sense yes so as you're asking the why to continue to break that down then it's giving you more clarity into what that well, problem yes is. and so and so. And on the back of the book, it's got the seven steps. And, and really, every one of these steps is a, a part of the bottom of the swamp sure. in business. Okay, so for example, step five, carve out the niche where you are the undisputed number one via star principle. Yeah. Now, probably most people wouldn't have trouble believing that if you want to be the most profitable company, you need to be number one. And they understand Coca-Cola is number one and Amazon is number one. Oh, you know, we get that. But what people don't realize usually is that if you're not number one, life sucks pretty much. Okay. Like, 7-Up is the number one in that kind of cola, and Coca-Cola is number one in that kind of cola, you really wouldn't probably want to work for Sierra Mist, quite <laughs> frankly. You really don't want to work for Mr. Pibb. Like, you, you don't want to work for Burger King. Like, those companies just fight mm. over the scraps. They get the leftovers, okay? Now this applies. This applies to everybody. 
most entrepreneurs, most copywriters, most web designers, most fill in the blank. They're just one among many, many people that can do fairly similar things. They don't realize, dude, you could be in some teeny, tiny, microscopic market like Vietnamese pot belly pigs. And if you're, if you're number one, you make a lot of money and you have high profit margins. You, like, if, if you're the only person who can, I don't know, like give nutritional injections to Vietnamese pot, pot belly <laughs> pigs, or, I'm, I'm just completely making this up, okay? Or like in, when, uh, when I was early in my career, I was the only direct marketing copywriter in the industrial networking mm. space. Sure. There was a million copywriters and guys that could write headlines, but I was the only guy who had that skill set and also understood this obscure little corner of manufacturing. So when I hung out my shingle, it wasn't that hard to make a living because I was the only one. And like you, you carve a market small enough, you can be the only one. You, Okay, I am the only copywriter who focuses on selling magnesium supplements to, I don't know, to triathletes or, or something. Like, you know, you just, if you know a market so well that you are undisputedly better than anybody, you're almost guaranteed to make a good one. Well, that's, you know, and that's actually kind of funny because I've a lot lately I've been talking about the riches are in the niches because <laughs> and really like really getting that dialed down and granular because that's what's going to separate you and and you capture and you kind of took it and said, OK, that's how you're going to be number one in that specific marketplace. Mm -hmm. That's right. And, and like you so you resolve like I am going to figure out what can I be number one in? And it needs to be a growing market. Sure. And, and if it is, if, if you've got both of those boxes checked, you're going to, you're going to make a good living. And th this applies to new products that you introduce and all kinds of things. And so most people are just spinning, 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 spinning their wheels, exhausting themselves, going into debt, uh, working 16 hours a day. And, it's not necessary. No, definitely. And I know we got a little bit of time left. I wanted to kind of dive into, I liked what you were talking about, the uh, four quadrants of work. I, I bet that oh, was yes. super cool and interesting. Yes. Okay, so yes, there are four kinds of work. Um, in fact, uh, I'll, I'll just show you the, the quadrants really quick here on the screen. And and what it, so I realized that we we don't have enough words for work and people indiscriminately lump very low productivity work and very high productivity work together, and they don't really, they don't really think it through. Um, but there's actually four kinds of work. So one quadrant is, I call it work ethic. Work ethic is you are in your 80-20 sweet spot. So. If you're an attorney and you bill 300 bucks an hour, it's you doing $300 an hour billable time for a client that you can really help and they're in your wheelhouse, right? And okay, and you, you're gonna make a good living. If, if you do, you know, a good, a few hours of that kind of work every day, you're gonna make a good living, you're gonna be fine, All right? So that's one kind of work, okay? Then there's, okay. again, that's work ethic. Then there's what I call, well, let, let's talk about sweetness. Another quadrant is you need to take a day off every mm, week. Yeah. Like, it, it, seriously, if you're working seven days a week, you are messing up. You're, you're killing your creative energy. You'll actually be more productive working six days a week and taking a day off and enjoying and relaxing and worshiping or being with your family, whatever. You'll, you'll be more productive taking the day off. I'm religious about taking Sundays off. I don't, I don't check my email. I don't like do any of that. 
It's it's a great okay. So that's sweetness. It's also spending the evening with your family, right. or going out to dinner, or whatever. Okay. Now the next quadrant is barnacles. Barnacles is predictable, low quality, OCD or obsessive um, filler. Gotcha. <laughs> okay, and, and al media. almost everybody <laughs> does this. Most okay, so so this is most time spent on social media like just sort of drugged out and sort of a haze. Okay. It's, you know, people will obsessively hit refresh on their email box 130 times a day. People, people will drive to the office supply store just because it makes mm -hmm. them feel busy. It's looking busy when you're really not accomplishing that much at all. It could be emptying the trash or cleaning the place when really some $15 an hour person should be doing that, not you. Okay. And you can steal lots of time from. Is that the new barnacles. $15 minimum wage? If you, if you, have, <laughs> yeah, you just well, pick that number. Minimum wage. <laughs> well, no, I'm, like, I'm like, just... like, you know, <laughs> so, no, the, the fourth quadrant is what I call Renaissance time and Renaissance time is unpredictably mm. productive. Okay. Work, which means it's not, it's not you billing $300 an hour as a lawyer. It might, if you're, it might be you having lunch with a potentially very interesting colleague that somebody introduced you to, and it will probably go nowhere, but it might be like a really interesting new connection. Like one time out of 20, it might right. really turn into something. Okay, that's Renaissance time. Um, spending 20 minutes in the morning before you do any email, any Facebook, any phone calls, anything. You pray, worship, meditate, journal, clear your head, do your mindfulness, whatever you want to call it. That's Renaissance time. It's unpredictably productive. Well, so if you carve out space for sweet sweetness, like Sundays off, if you time block your most productive time, so you're not doing barnacle work, you're doing work ethic time, and then you pay your bills, and then you're super conscious of barnacles, and you don't lapse into oh, I got to work and look, look busy right now. And then you push that into unpredictably productive time. Like, so now you've got time to explore, time to read, mm -hmm. time to go to a seminar, time to listen to an interesting podcast, not a time waster podcast. Okay. Like time to, time to go have lunch with Josh Felber and see what comes up. That's Renaissance time. And, and, and so what you'll find is that if you keep, like, keep the barnacles, like, absolute minimum, and then you, you block your work ethic time, your renaissance time will feed your energy and feed your creativity and get you into an upward spiral. But it, it, it's only going to do that if you run a lean business so that you're not right. feeding all these mouths. <clears throat> Okay, and so that, that is what this book is about. So you subtract, you subtract what is wasting your time, you subtract out barnacles, and then you feed energy into productive things and you make sure your work ethic is focused in the right areas, your business will grow and you'll be very profitable. And you'll be serving humanity much better than you were by looking busy. Yeah, no, that's super important. Guys, I hope you guys are really paying attention to what Perry's talking about today. Make sure you're using that Renaissance time. You're listening to this podcast, uh, taking notes, take jotting down, rewind, listen, and watch this again. There's so many little things that and big things that Perry's dropped throughout this interview today that you can take and apply that are totally going to transform where you're at personally, as well as in your business or in, in your professional uh, side of things. And so uh, listen to it, jot down those notes, 
unless you're driving, uh, then you can go do it when you get to the office or back home. And again, just uh, really pay attention to what he's talking about and apply that. You have to apply it, not just listen to that. Perry, one last thing uh, before we wrap up here. Uh, you're like, oh man, I was hoping Josh was going to ask me this. Uh, what's one last thing you really want to share with our audience uh, that you think will impact them? I want people to know that if you adopt the method in this book, see there, there's, I know there's, there's all kinds of time management sure. things and productivity things and getting done, things done things and how to do your morning and almost all of them, they pile more and more and more stuff like, well, you need to check this and then check this off and check this. Detox, declutter, dominate is the total opposite of that. It's like subtract, subtract, eliminate, eliminate, subtract, subtract, eliminate, eliminate. You have enough time to do the things that you want to do. Everybody is so time starved. You don't need to be time starved. I'm not time starved. I, if you look at the stuff I'm doing, it's crazy. I, I have started two 501c3s in the last eight months. Okay, and I like I can tell you whole stories about that. I have time to do that stuff because I I do eighty twenty and I focus. I have a good business; it's a growing business, and I can still do these other things. And it's a great life. Like you don't have to be a prisoner to Facebook and Instagram. You don't have to be a slave to your email box. You can have space. You don't have to look busy. You, you can get what you need, to, most of what you need to be done in three or four hours, not eight or 10. Yep. It's true. Awesome. Uh, Perry, thanks again for coming on Making Bank. Let everybody know where they can grab a copy of this at, um, and we'll have it here in the link as well. You go to Amazon.com. It's, it's about nine bucks US. Detox, declutter, dominate. This book will totally change your life. You can yep. read it in one hour. And you probably want to reread it every two months for the next two years. And you, you get this, you get this burned into your muscle memory. It will completely revolution. It's nice too. Cause it's a big one. You, I got notes and stuff right in mind. So it's, you don't have to like try to fit it all in these little tiny books and, and then cram it all in there. So it's nice to, that it's that larger size book and everything. So well, yeah, Perry, gosh, honored to have you on the show me. and appreciate you coming back on. It's always amazing to have you here and p picking up some new insights every single time. And uh, thank you again for being on Making Bank. I am Josh Felber. You are watching Making Bank. Get out and be extraordinary.